Hello and welcome to Revision Tips for SIPS Level 4 Diploma in Procurement and Supply. This is Module 8, Procurement and Supply in Practice, and it's Learning Outcome 3, which is to demonstrate the application of whole life asset management. <clears throat> so whole life asset management is also known as whole life cost management, and it relates to fixed assets. It aims to obtain the best value through the lifetime of the asset. It's the process of evaluating the total price and all other costs associated with the item, so an informed decision can be made about the options which provide the best value for money with the organisation. It's a continuous process that monitors performance of an asset once it's in situ and calculates the optimum time to replace or refurbish the asset. There are eight elements that form the cycle of whole life asset management. The first is to identify the need, objectives and risks. So for example, objectives that could be including more efficient, keeping costs or keeping up with, comp with the competitors. Then you think about the procurement. Consider all the elements within the whole life asset management cycle in the process to ensure that best value is gained. Then you've got the construction. Much of the cost of the asset is derived from this stage. A readily available or mass produced asset has lower design and manufacturing costs than bespoke items. Commissioning is bringing the asset into working conditions. And costs incurred at this stage include installation and training, insurance, testing, operational efficiencies and performance and quality. Then think about deterioration and maintenance. Assets that last longer without deterioration represent better value. And depreciation gives an indication of how quickly an asset loses value over time. Maintenance costs include the reliability of an asset, price and availability of parts and spares. The cost of skilled technicians or engineers frequency of service requirements and downtime due to maintenance. And then condition performance monitoring, which is carried out by a system that monitors key aspects such as temperature, vibration, speed and output. And that's in order to identify any defects early, so decisions can be made about preventing stoppages. And decommissioning, withdrawing an asset from service. And the cost incurred at this stage will include the cost of removal, the transport, the labour and downtime. The asset could be reconditioned at this stage to extend its life. And then finally, the renewal and replacement. This is when the whole life cycle starts again, as the decision is made about whether it's better for the organisation to continue using the existing asset or to purchase a new one. Global sourcing is the practice of obtaining products and services from the worldwide market, and that's normally in order to achieve cost savings. The savings are frequently achieved by seeking efficiencies in skilled labour, raw material or reduced import tariffs. And it usually involves an extended supply chain, which includes raw materials, um, and that's supplies from the primary sector, products and um, producers from the secondary sector, distributors from the tertiary sector, retailers in the tertiary sector, and then our customers and consumers. When using global sourcing and an extended supply chain, some costs are harder to identify and don't always present themselves at the starting point of a project. These are known as hidden costs, and examples include internal overheads, translation, mobilisation, language barriers and time differences, post-contract reviews and cultural differences, ethical behaviour, reputation, supplier financial positions, exchange rates, logistics and lead times, inventory, incompatibility and changes in duties and taxes and trade wars. So have a think about things like your internal overheads, your transitions and mobilisation and language barriers. How do each of these factors impact on hidden costs? 
such as language barriers, there'll be the cost of interpreters. But also misunderstandings could result in discrepancies, which would require costs to fix it. Now, the whole life asset management strategy takes considerable time. It involves many stakeholders. It requires lots of resources from departments around your organisation. And it requires cross-functional teams to be set up with representatives from many, if not all, departments. Now, being involved in cross-functional teams takes people away from carrying out their main job. And it does reduce their efficiency and output in their main role. But this reduction can only be justified financially if it will offset against potential purchase of an asset. Whole life asset management can create value when undertaking on high value procurements and will be a fixture within any organisation for many years. But for low value purchases, the cost of creating asset management work could far outweigh the costs of the asset which would not be deemed cost effective and would waste resources. So have a think about some cross-functional teams that you might work with in your organization. Which departments are involved? Finance, marketing, research, operations, sales, HR and procurement. What aspects of procurement would other departments be concerned with? So, for example, marketing, they'd think about whether or not the asset gives us a competitive advantage to promote to our consumers. What value does this give and for how long? Finance might be looking, for example, at tax implications. What's the rate of asset to depreciate? How much will insurance cost? Should we lease it? Should we buy it? What's the life expectancy of the asset? And is there a resale value of the asset at the end of its life? Now, when conducting whole life management, asset management, the procurement professional needs three things from senior managers. Authority, buy-in and support. Authority to proceed with the whole life asset management is based on available resources the validity of the business case and associated objectives. And buying comes from senior managers' belief in the concept, ideas, method and desired outcomes. And support in the form of helping to secure resources, clarifying the end goals, being a point of escalation if problems occur, and acting as an ally during difficult times. So procurement should create a business case to gain buy-in from their senior management for the application of whole life asset management. A business case should include things like an introduction, which outlines what the business case is about, an objective, an explanation of the desired outcome, the approach in terms of which approach will be undertaken, the resources, which lists all the resources that will be required, and finally a benefits, a summary of all the benefits that achieving this objective will bring. So if you have it available to you, try and obtain a copy of a business case that was created for an asset in your business. Review the document and check whether or not all of these areas have been covered. And are there any additional areas that were covered in your organisation's template? What types of content are in each of these sections, such as financial data, project plans? Where would you obtain that information from? Which, bar, which department is best placed to provide that data? And then what is the process for presenting that business case? Who presents it? Is it the author of the document or the procurement director? And who are they presented to? Senior managers, the board? And finally, who, who approves the business case? Now decommissioning is to take out of operation and dismantle. This comes at the end of an asset management life cycle. Processes and costs involved are often overlooked when applying whole life asset management. But reasons for decommissioning an asset could include it's reached the end of its useful life. It's no longer going to be cost effective. 
you require an update to keep up, up to date with competition. There could be an environmental reason or sustainability issues with the current asset. The organisation requires um, a product or service that's changed unexpectedly. Or there could be changes in legislation or regulations. But there are four stages in the decommissioning process if you refer to the slide. The preparation stage where you plan for the process and understand whether an asset is being disposed or recommissioned. The dismantling where you take it apart and remove it from the location. The processing, making sure that it's safe. Acquiring any licenses to dispose. And then the actual disposal. You need to remember things like cancelling and amending your insurance, commissioning your new asset and recycling where possible. Now most assets depreciate, which essentially means they reduce in value over time. So if you look at the graph on the slide, you'll see um, it starts off in year one at $100,000, I think, um, all the way down to nothing in year 10. And this is documented within accounting purposes. A partially depreciated asset still has financial value attributed to it. A fully depreciated asset has no financial value left. Now a fully depreciated asset should still feature on an organisation's balance sheet so the stakeholders are aware of what is owned. But it should be noted that, a fully, that it is fully depreciated. And when an asset comes to the end of life within an organisation it can either be fully or partially depreciated. So when an organisation sells or disposes of this asset, it's removed from the fixed assets list. And when the asset is no longer present on the fixed asset list, it can be removed from the balance sheet. Now, disposing of waste, if not done correctly, it could have detrimental effect on the environment and so on health and well-being of humans and animals. There are local, regional and national laws that need to be conformed to protect humans and the environment. Organisations' disposal of assets and waste is closely monitored around the world. These organisations can face large fines if they break waste disposal rules. Many companies are working hard to try and be more environmentally conscious and reduce the impact their waste has. Complying with regulations and disposing of assets in an environmentally friendly way reduces the risk of extra costs being added to the whole life asset management due to fines and So here you can see some of the laws and regulations on waste management that apply in the EU. You've got the battery directive, which is a regulation on the manufacturing, accumulation and disposal of batteries. The landfill directive aim to reduce the negative impact on the environment caused by wa la sorry, waste put into landfill. The hazardous waste regulations restrict the, rem the movement and storage of hazardous waste. And the WE directive, which set targets on recovering and recycling of electrical goods. That's the end of Learning Outcome 3. Thank you for watching.